Here we go. It's Monday, August the 7th, in the year of our Lord, 2023. You're listening to Law and Gospel. I'm Pastor Tom Baker, and we've been on KFUO for 26 years, talking about law and gospel. Do you really understand the distinction when we talk about the difference between the law and the gospel. These are actually two ways of becoming righteous in order to get to heaven. Yes, for 26 years, we've been talking about the two ways that a person supposedly can become righteous in order to get to heaven. There are numerous Bible verses to make that clear. But this coming Sunday, which is the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, August the 13th, there are three readings that are very helpful. The one is Job chapter 38. The second is Romans chapter 10. And the third is the gospel Matthew 14. So how do we explain to someone who doesn't understand to read the Bible, what's the difference between law and gospel? As I said, there are the two ways in which supposedly you can get to heaven. In Romans chapter 10, beginning with verse 5, Paul really clarifies this difference that we have been talking about for 26 years. He says, Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. Now, that's really important to understand. Namely, how does a person become righteous based on the law? That would be obedience to the commandments of God. And he explains it in verse 5. Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. Now, did you hear that? That's what we mean by living under the law. Every religion in the world outside of Christianity teaches that, that you can become righteous by obeying the commandments in whatever religion it is. But is that true? For do we not all fall short of the glory of God? See, that's the main point about the righteousness of the law. It is impossible to become righteous by obeying the law. It's not that you can outwardly obey the law. Uh, For example, Uh, You may not steal from someone, or you may not kill someone. But as the Sermon on the Mount, as it reveals, even the thought of murder or hatred against someone is a breaking of the fifth commandment. So you, you may feel secure in obeying the commandments outwardly, but inwardly you still disobey them by thought, word, and deed. So that's the righteousness based on the law. But what is the righteousness when we're talking about the gospel? That's verse six. But the righteousness based on faith, says, do not say in your heart, 
who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. In other words, the gospel is not based on your obedience to the law. It's based on your trust in the promises of Jesus Christ. That is what is meant by righteousness based on faith. And you can't say, well, I can bring Jesus down into my life by being good. No. Or if you really feel dead in sin, you can't bring Jesus up to you by de doing good either. You fall short every time. And Paul continues, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. So what is that word of faith? We know what the word of the law is. Do this and you will live. Nobody can do it. What is the word of faith? It's a confession with your mouth, according to verse 9, that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. What heart? Because when you are born, you're born with original sin, and your heart is evil. So what has to happen is you have to have a new heart. David talked about that in the Psalms. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, in my life, that occurred in my baptism when I was an infant. For others, we send missionaries out, and they speak of the word of God, and hearing about the gospel, one can come to faith and receive a new heart from the Holy Spirit that what, as it says, believes that Lord. That means he's God. He died so that you will never die. The scripture says, verse 11, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. You see, in Jesus' day, many of the Jews looked down on the Greeks, that is the Gentiles. They, they were not part of the saved. And therefore, when Jesus would eat and speak to Gentiles, they were really upset. But God makes it clear that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, not only of the Jews, but also of the Greeks, the Gentiles. It is true that God brought salvation to the earth through the Jewish people. He chose them in Abraham while well, he was still a Hebrew and came to bring faith to all those who trusted in the promises of Isaac that there would be a Savior who would come through his seed, which happened with the Virgin Mary. 
you believe in Jesus Christ, you will not be put to shame. What does that mean? It means that you will not be held accountable for your sins. What's the word we use for that? It's the word forgiveness. There is no forgiveness under the law. You disobey the law, you deserve, as we say in our liturgy, yes, eternal pain, eternal perdition. But under the gospel, there is no shame because Jesus paid for your sins. And that's why there's no distinction if you are Jewish or Gentile. The same Jesus is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. And how do you call on Jesus? It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You call on Jesus when you receive faith from the Holy Spirit that Jesus is Lord, that he is the one who died on the cross, who paid for every one of your sins, your past, your present, and your future. And that doesn't mean that you are now free to sin, but it means that you are freed from your sin, freed from the consequences that are detrimental when we sin. We still may experience those consequences in the temporal realm, but in the spiritual realm, in the Holy Christian Church, when you go to heaven, you will not be experiencing negative consequences because Jesus experienced them all on the cross. You call on the name of the Lord, that means you have faith. And it's a faith given to you by the Holy Spirit. Nobody can concoct that faith because the faith of which Scripture speaks is really quite ridiculous. In fact, it talks about that it is impossible to believe apart from faith. But then Paul goes ahead in verse 14 and asks the question, but how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? <clears throat> what a great question. If you're an unbeliever, you can't call on him. There, there are actually people in the world who think that you become a Christian by making a decision for Jesus Christ. When you are an unbeliever, that doesn't make any sense at all. If you're an unbeliever, you won't do something that you don't believe. Why would you call on Jesus if you hate him? Just take a look at the unbelieving Pharisees. They despised Jesus until the Holy Spirit created faith in them. Guess what? They crucified him. So, Paul's asking the question, how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? Now you see the goal of the church. The goal of the church is to get people to listen to Jesus. And we talk about Jesus in our sermons, in the liturgy, in the readings, we really discover who Jesus is in the sacrament of holy baptism and the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. How are they to hear 
without someone preaching. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, what does that mean? Why is it that their feet are beautiful? Because these are feet that go to a people to announce the good news of the gospel. You aren't saved by the law. That is a wrong view of salvation. You are saved instead by hearing the gospel. And the gospel includes the promises concerning Jesus Christ, the promises made during his life, suffering, death, and after his resurrection. He that believes in me shall live. That's why the feet are beautiful of those who preach the good news. Verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. That's very true. A lot of people reject the message of Jesus Christ of the gospel. They have rejected it, which means they don't listen to it. They not have obeyed it. And he quotes from Isaiah, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So how does faith occur? Verse 17 is so clear. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You know, for my doctorate, I studied over 100 catechisms. And it was sad to see how a number of catechisms, that is, teaching the faith, began with trying to prove the scriptures are true. Now, I believe the scriptures are true, but that didn't come about because it was proven to me. For example, there's no doubt that God created the world in six 24-hour days, not from evolution. How did I come to know that? Because that's what the Bible says. In other words, that faith I had in how God created the world comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. That's why Job 38 is the Old Testament reading for the day where the Lord is talking to Job. Job is not happy with his sick condition. And he's wondering, what did I do to deserve this? Where is God? Listen to the first question that Job is asked in Job 38, verse 4. Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. In other words, what God is doing to Job is saying, oh, you think you're so important and that you have great understanding of how I operate. But tell me, who determined the measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone? 
when the morning stars sang together and all of the sons of God shouted for joy. Where were you, Job? Were you creator of the world? Did you have that kind of understanding? No. I am the creator of the world. I am the one who did these things. Or, verse 8, Who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness, darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said to the oceans, Thus far shall you come, and no further. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Yeah, go down to the ocean and see the waves lapping up on the shore. Did Job have any control over that? No. God continues to question Job. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Job, verse 16. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? For example, I enjoy watching YouTube, and one of the things they do is that they're traveling as best as they are able, into the depths of the ocean. They're going to depths where human beings cannot possibly exist because of the pressure of the sea. And they're finding creatures down there swimming around, living, showing forth light from their bodies to see where they can go having all kinds of characteristics that creatures higher up in the sea do not have. And yet, God entered into the recesses of the deep because he created them. He then goes on to say to Job, have the depths, have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Now that would be the place of the dead that Jesus visited after his resurrection when he descended into hell and preached victory to those who were in Sheol. And those were the spirits of those who had died during the floods of Noah, the unbelievers. And God is asking Job, have those gates of death been revealed to you yet? No. Finally, verse 18, have you comprehended the expanse of the earth Declare, if you know all this. Now, it is really amazing to understand the atmosphere of the earth. From a scientific point of view, there are things going on on the earth that some scientists say with the thousands of other planets in the universe, there should be some place that is just like the earth. 
But the more you understand the expanse of the earth, the atmosphere, the place from the sun, the more it becomes obvious there is no planet like earth in the entire universe. There are no beings anywhere else except here on earth. And those beings, although they are born in natural sin, they are brought into a right condition with God because of Jesus Christ, because of his death, his resurrection. That's the good news for this coming Sunday, showing clearly the distinction between the law and the gospel, righteousness only by the gospel. I'm Tom Baker. Join us for tomorrow's issue on the hymn for this coming Sunday. Until then, God bless you. Listen to Law & Gospel each weekday morning at 9.30 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law & Gospel, please make your check out to Law & Gospel and mail to Law & Gospel P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri, 63132, or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962. Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.